Mr. President, thank you for providing me this body. A few minutes to discuss my six years serving in this body. It has been a true honor. Too honored to serve with you in the short time that you are here, but to all my colleagues. But an even bigger honor to serve Alaskans, my fellow Alaskans. Alaska is a huge state, 660,000 square miles. More than, to my friends from Texas and California, please don't take this personally, but more than double and triple the size of states like Texas and California. But as Alaska is a very small place in many ways. People make personal connections with their elected official. At the end of the day, we pretty much know everybody, one way or another. Alaskans more than likely will see me at a checkout stand at Andy's Hardware or Home Depot or hanging Christmas lights at my wife's store or doing the errands with my son Jacob at times that he's not very anxious to do. Uh, but it is a small state and they'll see me more doing that than honestly on the floor making speeches or on C-SPAN. So when Alaskans contact me with an idea or a complaint or a problem, we made sure we responded. After six years in the Senate, I'm most proud of the work that helping Alaskans and their families. My office responded to more than 360,000 individual letters and emails and phone calls from Alaskans. To put it in perspective, 360,000 is roughly half the population of the state. Lots of my staff are here with me on the floor today. I thank them for their unwavering service to their fellow Alaskans. Truly, I have the best of the best. Some that worked with me when I was mayor and now working for me as senator. Many will go on and continue to do incredible work, not only for Alaskans, but for this country. I thank them. We took on 3,000 individual casework in cases to help Alaskans navigate the federal government, helping them get their Social Security checks, making sure the local post office actually delivers the mail in Alaska, that's important. Fighting for benefits for individual veterans. But I'm also proud of the great policy work we did. And, and when I say we, it's because sometimes ideas came from Alaskans, sometimes they came from this body, sometimes uh, I would have a crazy idea I'd write down on a sheet of paper, but at the end of the day, it was my staff that did the work. Opening Alaska's Arctic lands and water to responsibly resource development, NPRA, CD5, Beaufort, and Chuck Chi. Also helped convince the EPA to free up permits for Kensington and Greens Creek mines, the Arctic. When I first came in the office, I have to say that not everybody knew where the Arctic was. Some didn't even know it was an ocean, to be frank with you. But that's not the case today. Probably some of my colleagues got tired of hearing me always talk about Alaska, no matter what they said. Actually, I would have these maps, and I just saw my friend here, Al Franken, and he remembers this. I, he is incredible. He draws incredible maps of the United States. One day he drew that map. He does it all freehand. And I remember when we were drawing that map one day, and I said, you missed two things, Alaska and Hawaii. He says, well, when I drove around, if I remember this right, drove around in my car and traveled with my parents, they weren't states. They were just territories. <laughs> and the maps they bought were just the maps of the low 48. So I sent him a dot to dot of Alaska. He sent me back a nice letter with the map of Alaska drawn. And you know, when you think about the Arctic and Alaska, I know my colleagues at times, we didn't matter the issue we were talking about, somewhere or another I would weave in Alaska into the conversation. The Arctic is an unbelievable potential. We have just touched the tip of the iceberg and more work to be done. Working on defense, an important part of Alaska, the military bases securing F-16s for Isleson and getting F-35s and making sure the benefits for those that are serving continue to be there for them. One of my I think important accomplishments that I just, it's incredible to hear the stories, the veterans 
the new model of care that we developed over two and a half, three years ago. 77,000 veterans serve in our state, or live in our state. And it was an idea, I remember when I was campaigning in 08, I called it the Heroes Health Card, and I remember when I got in the office, people said it'll never happen. And of course, people who know me, when you say never or no, that means just yes, they just didn't spell it properly. And I have to figure out what to do. Today, now in Alaska, it doesn't matter if you're a veteran in the smallest rural communities or the biggest cities, you will get health care and access to it through our tribal health care delivery system, the first in the nation. And I remember the example of how important it was when I was in Bethel one time, and this gentleman came up to me, he was a veteran, I was in a VFW hall, a lot of us have been in VFW halls, and you know when someone's coming at you at an aggressive pace. Uh, it's not probably a positive situation, but you do have a conversation you have to engage in. And he said to me, he held his hand out and showed me these scars, he said, I had to go to Anchorage to get this taken care of, and you told me that I could go down to my clinic and get it taken care of, and I, that didn't happen. And then I was about to explain, and he turned to me, and then he said, but you know what I get to do because of what you did? Every single week now when I need my therapy, I can go down the street in Bethel and not fly to Anchorage to get it done. That is a model of how to do the right thing. When it came to fisheries, Alaska is well known for it. And uh, I know, I don't mean to pick on Senator Franken, but I remember him coming up to me because we coined a phrase on modified engineered fish. We call it Frankenfish. It was not about you, right? <laughs> but it was uh, about this fish that was chemically enhanced that would really destroy our fisheries in Alaska and be bad for the market and bad for consumers. We fought because Alaskans brought it to our attention every single day. Or native rural health care, which I just mentioned some of the things we did for two decades. And it wasn't just about what we did for Alaska. Everything we tried to do in our office is, can we do it for Alaska and does it have an internet national impact? Will it impact the rest of the country in a positive way? And I remember hearing and reading about the money owed to our tribes for money that was not paid by the federal government for two decades, of dollars for clinical services they produced. And we did some things and the net result was Alaska received over $500 million in settlements over the last year. But on top of that, many tribes across the country now, almost three quarters of a billion dollars for money that was owed by this federal government, for services that were delivered to individuals. And earlier this week, we were able to pass another piece, taking away the restriction of our tribes in Alaska so they can now, under the Violence Against Women's Act, we hope the House passes it, to be able to dispense and do tribal government in a sense of uh, justice system and improving the situation on the ground when it comes to sexual assault, domestic violence, and substance abuse. There are a lot of examples. But, you know, it's hard when you talk about these because there are great things that have been done, not just individually, but collectively. But in this place, we spend a lot of time doom and gloom and how the sky's falling in the worst case scenario. But, you know, we've come a long way in the last six years. I, I think about, and people who know me, I don't care how bad the situation is, I am positive about it. Because there's always another day to solve these problems and make things happen. And when I think about where we were, I remember coming on this floor as a freshman in 09. The chaos in this economy was unbelievable. The amount of jobs we were losing, 600 plus thousand a month, equal to my whole population of my state. Unemployed, boom, gone. Oil or the issues of unemployment was around 10%, stock market 6,500. Two of the largest automobile industries in this country flat on its back. No housing starts were happening, market was crashing, deficit was $1.4 trillion per year. I mean, as a new member, it was, I wasn't sure what I got myself into, to be frank. And some of the members that came with me were trying to figure out what did we get. But we didn't sit around, and I know always you hear this doom and gloom out there. But you look back in six years, we had some battles here. And most people think we don't do anything. But where are we today? <clears throat> 17,000 plus in the stock market today. I can tell you Alaskans saw this because every year, because I know I hear from my members who ask me this question all the time, we get a permanent fund check. It's based on investments we make, based on revenues that we receive from oil and gas. 
That permanent fund check doubled this year, from 800 to under 1,900. Why did it double? Because it's based on a stock market average of the last five years, and we dropped off 09. So the market was doing better. Every Alaskan felt it, felt what this economy has done. So when the naysayers are out there, it's just not accurate. And I think of GM and Ford and Chrysler, they have added over a half a million jobs. Good paying jobs, unemployment 5.8, almost a 50% drop. Over 10 million new jobs in the longest stretch of private sector growth on record, 56 months. Just last week, and I know you always hear it's not good enough. Well, of course, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was six years. I just remember the chaos on this floor in those three, four months, and as a new member, what we had to go through. And the deficit? has dropped by a billion, or a trillion, I said a billion, a trillion dollars a year. We're down to about 480 billion now. We've sliced off a trillion a year in deficit, annual deficit costs. In Alaska, we've seen some incredible things. Anchorage unemployment, 4.9. More jobs in mining and timber than ever before. Tourism, nearly one million visitors. 78,000 people in the fisheries job, fishery industry. But it's important to remember this is just a moment in time of challenges we have as a body and as a country. It's important to remember there's lots of work ahead of us. But we have accomplished a lot. But we spend a lot of time on this floor debating what's bad about this country. Rarely do you have, and I mean, we're seeing it now because a lot of us are coming down and giving our farewell, farewell speeches and talking about good things. And there are a lot of things that we should be proud of. As a country, I'm proud of the last six years of what we've done. This country is back on track. We have more work to do to make sure people's incomes rise, but that's starting to happen now. The challenge is gonna be for my colleagues that are still here and for this country is, you know, it's been an incredible honor to, to be in this body, but what do we do to make sure we move forward? So we don't have this as a platform of negative attitudes and views, but about opportunity and possibilities. Not about things that we sit here and try to figure out how to kill, but what we try to do to improve and give new ideas a chance. You know, I said it earlier, I, I'm a very optimistic person. I believe in what's possible today can be even better tomorrow. But it's incumbent on people to believe it, to want to do it, to put aside our differences where we can. I tell you, in Alaskans, it's why less are party registered and more are non-party registered in Alaska than most states. Because our view is we don't care about the party. What we care about is getting things done, trying to find the answer to yes rather than trying to find the way to no. You know, my staff was always, you know, it's a struggle sometimes, and I have a great staff, as I said earlier, some from Alaska, some from here, some from across the country, people who I don't understand why they subjected themselves to continue to work for me after, you know, mayor's office and they came here. Uh, but I always told them it didn't matter who sponsored the bill. What mattered was, was it a good idea? If it was a good idea, then let's move forward. Try to find an answer to it. Try to solve the problem. You know, the the positive attitude we have to have is also not only important for this body, but it's important for this country. In a weird way, they, they love us and hate us. The poll numbers show they don't love us too much, 13%. Uh, but on the flip side, they look to us. They look to us for certainty and guidance and where we might take them. The pundits, different, but the people do. I see it when I go to stores and I'm out and about. And people may be angry with us, but they want to know what we're going to do to solve these incredible problems. And it will be incumbent upon the next Congress to sit down and work together. It's going to be tough because the politics of today are about the moment in time. It's not about the long term. This is an incredible challenge that has to be dealt with in some way. You know, I've spent a lot of time trying to, like I said, do what I can. It didn't matter who it was, and I was listening to Senator Coburn speak, and 
I remember one day we were working on an issue on a, a essential air service. Some of us have that in our state, in Alaska, very important. And uh, Senator Coburn was against it. And I remember having a conversation with them, trying to explain between one airport to the next is 1,200 miles. <laughs> there's no road. There's no way to get to it. At the end of the day, we were able to resolve that issue and move forward. You know, I think of all the things that have been accomplished in this body, but how little people know about it. In an odd way, this last few days, more of that positive issues are out there. Hope the press cover it. We'll see. But we live in a world that it's better to talk about the negative because that seems to be what drives the opinions. I hope that changes. Let me end by saying a couple other just quick thoughts. You know, there's a lot of great stories being here in the Senate. Someone asked me one day, do you write these down? And I said, no. And I remember it was in Sitka, Alaska, and I was headed to the airport, got to the airport, and the attendant there was checking on my ticket. said, oh, wait, Mr. Baggage, we, we have something for you. I said, what's that? It's a gift. It's a wrapped gift at the airport. So great. Now, for people who care about TSA, please ignore what I'm about to say. Uh, they just handed it to me. I took it. I opened it up, and it was one of those empty books that was a note from someone. See, please write down your thoughts and your notes. And there are incredible thoughts. I remember when I was coming through, and people will remember this when it snowed like crazy here. Well, people in D.C. thought it snowed like crazy. Uh, I did not. And, but I knew one thing, how the plowers work. As a former mayor, I thought to myself, I can't leave my car on the street because they'll plow me in, especially in this place, or they'll attempt to. So I got my car, my son, Jacob, got our snow shovels, shoveled it out, drove the car into another area. And then I realized, and we were dressed in what I call Alaska good garb, and then I realized, oh my gosh, I gotta get back to the house I got this snow shovel, and he has a snow shovel. So it was on the side of the capillary. So what do we do? People who know me, I don't really follow all the rules around this place. Um, we started walking through the capitol with our snow shovels on, over our shoulders. The place was empty. And I realized what an incredible place this is. First, allowing us to walk through with snow shovels. Um, but the, it was dead silent. As you walk through, if you've never done that, you should. You walk through the Capitol. And you just see the history. And in a small way, we were part of it. Or when I did break another rule, it's confession time. I'm a Catholic. I can do that. Uh, we came into this chamber. I had the corner desk over here. Why did I pick that desk? A lot of people don't know this story. Why did I do that? One, I was a junior member. But two, I wanted that desk because that's where the candy box was. <laughs> and I knew every member would have to go there sooner or later. <laughs> And I thought I could spend some time talking to him. And maybe I'd have a candy box, which I did. And I had special candies from my wife's store. And one day I came in here late at night with my son, and we sat right there. I know the security guards probably didn't see us, and we took a photo. Yes, I broke the rules. <laughs> and I took a photo of him sitting there. I will cherish that forever. As my son once said, and I said it on his floor one time, about how important it is to get things done and the battle we were having. And I remember I actually quoted on the floor, and I think I again shocked somebody. And he said to me, I was talking to him about something, and he says, Dad, just suck it up. <laughs> and I thought, only from a young kid can you get the, what you got to do sometimes. Now, I didn't forget her. I just wanted to wait to the end. My wife is, and I know I'm breaking rules, but she's right up there. 
I'm pointing to her. Yes, I am. And uh, Sergeant Arms, too bad. Um, and I'm acknowledging her. And she has been incredible. She has allowed me to do my public service, to fly those 20 hours every weekend to and from Alaska. She has taken care of Jacob when I couldn't. I love her dearly. Thank you. To end, I'll just say this. It has been a true honor to serve the U.S. Senate, to serve the people of Alaska, and to know every day we me, my members, and my staff, colleagues who worked with me, contributed a little bit to making life better for an Alaskan, for Alaskans, for this country. There's no place like serving in this body and doing what I could to make a difference. Mr. President, I yield the floor.